to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Any changes to the agenda? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, just to note all of the reports were handled under the work session except for the administration of the community survey item. Oh, I thought we were covering that at the work session. Um, that was my fault. All right. Okay, any motions? Motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Josh. Second. Second by Kate. All in favor? Aye. 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 Then it's adopted. Uh, first thing we have a presentation. Um, it's not a real formal presentation, but uh, as everyone knows, we were recognized by SafeWise as the safest community or safest city in Minnesota. So, and this is what each of the last five years I think we've been on there, or four out of the last top, five years we're in the, the top five. five yep. So that's a, a tremendous credit to the police department and administration and. Yeah, here's the certificate if anybody wants to see. I think that's all we're going to do for the presentation. Okay. So, uh, moving on, public comment. Anyone here for public comment? All right, we'll move on to consent. Motion to approve consent agenda. It's motion by Kate. Second by Josh. All in favor? Aye. 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 Consent agenda is passed. <clears throat> On to public hearings. Livable Communities Act. All right, I promise I'm going to keep this moving so I don't have too many slides to go through. All right, so before the council opens the public hearing, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of the Livable Communities Act, uh, since we do have some new council members. Uh, since the last time these goals were adopted, or rather the city opted in to participate. So the Livable Communities Act uh, was adopted by the Minnesota legislature in 1995. It's implemented right now uh, by the Metropolitan Council and it is basically a program that provides funding for communities to invest in economic revitalization, workforce and affordable housing, and then really that transit-oriented development. It is voluntary, um, so you don't have to participate, but if you do want to, you have to opt in. So to compete for LCA funding, the local government organizations must meet certain criteria. Uh, these are the criteria that basically uh, need to be met to opt in to the program. The first is to adopt a long-term affordable and life cycle housing goals. This is really what is the first step to opt into the program and it runs on a 10 year cycle. Uh, the second one is to develop a housing action plan. Uh, really, the purpose of that plan is to accomplish these goals that a city adopts. And then um, the local government organizations must also spend 85% of the required affordable and life cycle housing opportunities amount, or ALHOA, for each year of participation. And really, that dollar amount is just an expense of local dollars on activities that, again, help you reach these goals. And then finally, to actually receive any dollars from the LCA, so you apply for a grant, you are awarded a grant to actually get the dollars, a city must also have a local fair housing policy. So specific to Elko New Market, uh, in regards to the long-term affordable and life cycle housing goals, um, Elko New Market did opt into the program in the last decade, so 2011 to 2020. Since 2020, uh, we have not adopted new or updated goals. So as of right now, we are not participating in this program for 2021 through 2030. And so the ask for tonight is that the council consider adopting these goals to participate in the program. Uh, the affordable housing goal, like it sounds, is really specific to developing or fostering affordable housing units. 
Um, the methodology for developing these numbers is pretty straightforward. Uh, the upper end of the range is based specifically on the need identified by the Met Council of affordable housing. Um, for Elko New Market, for this 10-year period, that is 326 units, um, and that is reiterated in our 2040 comp plan as well. And then to identify the lower end of the range, uh, the Metropolitan Council has adopted this methodology where that upper end need is just multiplied by 55%. Um, my understanding is that 55% is kind of identified as the number of housing units, affordable housing units rather, that could be built or constructed with the dollars available in the LCA um, account. So the proposed affordable housing goals range is 179 units to 326. And then um, the other goal is the life cycle housing goal. Um, this goal, unlike the affordable housing, is geared more so towards just ensuring that communities allow for a variety of housing types to serve you know, residents and people at all ages. And this number is uh, determined based on the total land acreage expected to develop as multifamily over the next decade times the medium density of those respective acreages. Uh, so for Elko New Market, the total acreage guided to multifamily or would allow multifamily is almost 44, and then the medium density is 20 uh, units per acre. In regards to the requirement that a city adopt the Housing Action Plan, um, the Metropolitan Council has opined that cities' comprehensive plans fulfill that requirement. We do have a chapter specific to housing, and it states um, pretty explicit goals that would help us meet the affordable and life cycle housing goals that we consider tonight. And then uh, in regards to the Alhoa amount, um, for the past several years of participation, the Scott County CDA, their spending has actually fulfilled this requirement on behalf of the city, and we anticipate that moving forward that will continue. And then finally, again, um, at some point, if the council does uh, choose to opt into this program, we apply for funding and receive it, we would um, need to adopt a local fair housing policy doesn't need to happen immediately, but something to consider for the future. So at this time, I'm just asking the council to hold the required public hearing uh, related to participation in the LCA program and uh, the proposed affordable and life cycle housing goals, and then consider adoption of resolution number 21-63. Okay, thank you. So we'll open the public hearing at 708. Anyone? Patrick, you got anything for us? <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing at 708. Um, council, discussion, board motions. What's a typical grant for funding? Like That's a great question. I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> um, to note, though, which I did not mention, in 2012, the city did apply for a grant funding to clean up the dump site on the CDA library uh, senior housing building, and we received funding through that to do that. So. It doesn't seem like there's any harm in being part of this. So. Anyone? Motion to approve resolution 2163. Motion to Kate. Second. Second by Josh. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, it passes. <clears throat> On to general business. So under general business tonight, we have uh, an ordinance for council consideration to address pawnbrokers and precious metal dealers. The council recall that we've placed a moratorium, um, put it in place this year to allow sufficient time for us to develop an ordinance for adoption. Um, that has been Haley's project, and she'll be presenting on this particular item. Yes. Again, uh, I hope to keep this short, so I'll just go right along. Um, 
background, in the summer of 2020, so just over a year ago, we did receive inquiries from a property owner about the potential for locating a pawn shop in the Newmarket downtown area. Um, just in responding to those inquiries and reviewing the city code, it was determined that as of right now, our city code does not have any specific regulations related to pawn shops or similar retail type shops. Um, and it would pe be permitted in any zoning district that allows retail. Um, this quickly led to concerns by city staff, um, and as Tom mentioned, the council did adopt a moratorium um, on the establishment of pawn shops, and then also directed staff to consider city controls to regulate these. So that moratorium was adopted on September 24th of 2020 and lasted one year, so it has since expired. And for this slide, I'm going to invite Chief Jewell to discuss some of the public safety concerns which led to these regulations. So um, I went through a similar process in Chaska prior to coming here. Um, Scott County has several pawn shops in different cities throughout um, the northern portion of the county. Uh, pawn shops to um, not beat around the bush are basically legal fences for stolen property. Many items that are stolen do not have serial numbers and there's no proof of ownership with them. Uh, pawn shops are ways for people to turn stolen items into cash uh, is the basic premise. Um, in working many, as a detective, in working many stolen item cases, uh, oftentimes these would turn up at pawn shops near Jaska. And uh, that's the basis of my opinion. It's not personal, it's professional. Um, Many items are stolen due to drug habits and drug addictions and the need for people who cannot work due to their drug addictions. It's a way for them to make money to supply that. Um, I've worked easily hundreds of cases and know of hundreds of cases where the items end up at stolen fence properties. May I advance? Um, Pawn shops create a huge demand on law enforcement. You might think, well, how is that? Well, pawn shops, and part of this ordinance is requiring the pawn shops to register everything that comes in that has a serial number onto what is, they've changed the name, but it's called an automated pawn network. Everything that has a serial number will get entered in. Whenever somebody pawns something, they must show a photo ID, a state controlled photo ID, when they pawn that item. You might be thinking, well, that's a great thing because if you recover stolen property, you know who pawned it. It is a good thing. And oftentimes you can get that property back to the owner. But in order to do that, it takes an extreme amount of law enforcement labor to do that. Oftentimes, not netting charges because the burden of proof to show that that person stole that item is extremely hard. So you're doing a lot of work not to recover somebody else's property and not getting charges from it. So it's not doing society good that you're charging people criminally for this. So it takes a ton of time. Not just on for our city, crimes committed in our city, but we will be doing work for other communities because what is gonna happen is when you steal something in one community, you don't go to that community to pawn it, you go to another community. Because the locals will know what was stolen and can easily check. So we'll get um, Blaine, Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park stolen items down here. Those agencies don't want to drive all the way, so they call the local jurisdictions that have the pawn shop, and we have to spend our time investigating their crimes. It's just no one has the resources. So... It's not only our community, but it is other communities impacted that we do the work for them without getting any of the, not helping our citizens. Um, 
just as you can imagine, if you go into a um, pawn shop, you see cell phones, home electronics, construction tools are huge. Many of our stolen construction tools from our sites end up at pawn shops because people just don't record those serial numbers and there's no way to get it back. Um, moths to a flame theory. Um, when you have the pawn shop, there's criminals coming to that pawn shop. Oftentimes, that can lead to them being in our area and taking advantage of our community members. Um, someplace close, they might not pawn it here, but we're bringing them to our community, which is not exactly what you want. Um, this will put our city on the map for people we don't really want to be here. And as not having a pawn shop near here, we're going to attract people Obviously not everyone that uses a pawn shop is a criminal, but there are many that do. They're not, they're going to be coming from Owatonna, they're going to be coming from Northfield, they're going to be coming from um, south of us a ways to get to our pawn shops because there's, they've been banned from or they've been found pawning stolen items. So the benefit to the community is is not there to bring this type of business in or to not have it regulated. So when I was working with Haley on this and we were working together, I pointed them to Chaska's ordinance. Um, Chaska does not have pawn shops because of their ordinance. And if we are the mechanism, are you going to go over the mechanisms of it? Okay, I'll let her do that. Um, before though, uh, any questions about that from on my part? I'm trying to go quick, so I just don't. I'm trying to paint a picture quickly, Bob Ross like. Done. All right. Uh, so, as staff move forward with research on what the most common city controls or what our regulations should be, we found that pretty much any city that regulates pawn brokers or pawn shops is through a business license. Um, so, this is. Uh, Title IV of the city code, it's under the purview of the city council. It's not uh, required to be reviewed by the planning commission. Um, however, some cities in regards to the zoning ordinance do list pawn shops as a specific use. Um, it is staff's opinion that we should just continue to allow them as retail, um, but then of course still require a business license. So as of right now, there are no proposed zoning ordinance amendments, just the amendments to the um, business license section. Uh, so as stated, this is Title IV, um, and the proposed ordinance amendments create a new Chapter 11 specific to pawnbrokers and precious metal dealers. Um, as stated, it requires both to apply for a business license. And uh, the draft ordinance is, of course, attached in the packet, so I'm not going to go over it in detail. But some notable provisions are um, just the outline of the license application requirements, specific ineligibility criteria, um, the requirement of a background check, associated fees in regards to the background investigation, the annual license, and billable transactions, the requirement of a $10,000 bond, uh, there is also a provision for a per capita limit on licenses based on the population. The requirement that all transactions are reported to the PD, as Brady stated. And then, of course, um, it outlines criteria for denial, suspension, or revocation of a license. So in association um, with consideration or adoption of regulations specific to pawnbrokers, uh, there is another section of the city code that would need to be amended. Um, section 4-1-13 basically just outlines a list of city licenses that requires a background check. So uh, we would be adding pawnbrokers and precious metal dealers to that list. And then um, kind of separately from pawnbrokers, um, this ordinance amendment also removes solicitors from the list of licenses that requires a background check. This is correcting an oversight from a previous amendment that was made in 2019. 
Um, at that time, solicitors were kind of revised to, instead of requiring a license, require just a straightforward registration. And with the registration, a background check was no longer required. So we just need to strike that from the list. And then uh, finally, in association with any regulations, uh, we need to amend the 2021 schedule of fees. Uh, so you can see the fees uh, stated here for the investigation fee, the annual license, a new manager investigation fee, and then the billable transaction fee. These are equivalent with what we currently require for a sexually oriented business license. Um, and then Chief Jewell has also opined that these fees are sufficient to cover the resources <coughs> necessary to run these background checks and do the investigation. So at this time, uh, staff is just asking the council to consider ordinance number 236, ordinance number uh, 237, and ordinance number 238. Thank you. Any <coughs> questions or comments? Tell me about the billable transaction fee and what that means. Like for every transaction that's done there's a fee charged and how is that determined and um, yeah so your interpretation is basically correct for any item that is pawned there is a billable transaction fee my understanding is that is because with every transaction they have to report it to the police which then creates a demand on our officers uh, so a fee is charged to try and cover that as best as we can. Um, the dollar fifty is pretty much standard across all cities. So every community, that was the amount. And that is only on items that somebody's trying to sell there, not purchase, correct? Correct. Pawn, when somebody pawns Pawn something there, that would be their fee. It's passed on usually to the customer. So this kind of feels like, a, hey, we, we'll have an ordin ordinance, we'll allow you to come in our city, but we really don't want you. Is that uh, an unfair assessment? I don't know if I want to speak to that, but based on my conversations with Chief Jewell, who is maybe more familiar with this, that would be fair. Okay. It would be, if you're going to come here, we're going to make sure that the taxpayers aren't paying for your business to be here. So are we under any obligation to allow pawn shops? Can you expand on that? Well, can we say no pawn shops? Yeah, can we just say no pawn shops? Can we restrict? No. We can't. Okay. So, so the best we can do is we can regulate them to the degree that it reduces, mitigates yeah. the impact to our residents. And with the fees, we can't make them punitive, but we can make sure that they're set to fully recover um, the cost that it takes to administer the license and sure. implement it. I will note too that when doing the research, the ordinance language in almost all of the cities is very similar. Yeah. Almost word for word exactly the same, so it's not uncommon. So these fees are basically unilateral across the board for other cities, the 1500 the 5000 the 250 I would say only for the billable transaction. Okay. They vary. Uh, some cities are much higher, some are a little bit lower. So how did you come up with your yeah. fee structure? Yeah, so the fee structure was based on what we currently charge for sexually oriented businesses. Um, because they're similar license in nature and application requirements, it made sense that they were similar in fees. Okay. We tried to make the fees reasonable for what a background check would cost and you're basically paying our detective, our sergeant, to do an mm -hmm. extensive background that can take weeks and many hours to, to perform. I'm wondering if we can check how close. <laughs> and the an annual license fees intend to cover our cost annually to administer the license. So all of those burdens on the department and administration over the course of the year when you have that type of business in town, we would reasonably adjust it over time if we had such a business and once we had experience, but right now that's our best case. Okay. All right. 
I mean, and I guess I would just say that all of this is great. And, uh, I mean, I think it's absolutely necessary, but if somebody really wants to get around it, they're just not going to report their crap anyway, right? I mean, so they're going to not not say that they had any billable transactions today or leave out the one that I brought in to cover me and... and um, there what, might even be statute to cover that they have to register every item with the local jurisdiction or a commensurate program like that automated pond network. Mm -hmm. So there might even be something in state statute that refers to that they have to do that. But that is a risk. Right. I mean, I guess I'm saying let's do it in the driveway or come over to my house. I mean, I, I can do anything privately, pay with cash. People sell and, right. stolen stuff all the time on the internet, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Craigslist mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, market, Facebook Marketplace. Um, there are very reputable pawn shops and they will work, most pawn shops will work with law enforcement. This isn't to punish them, it's just to recover the cost to yeah. our community, basically. Because as you can imagine, they're victims too when they buy something right. stolen. I want to portray that too. When they buy something stolen, we come, they might give $500 for uh, high-end electronics something we come and take that from them. So they're victimized too because they gave money, you know, out, but, um, so. So we had a temporary moratorium on these until we could come up with an ordinance. We came up with an ordinance. We, it's a business we have to allow, or we have to at least provide the ability if they so chose. Does anybody, have any issues with what's being proposed or want to make any changes? If not, can we do all these in one motion? Motion to approve 236, 237, 238. It's a motion by Kate. Second. It's a second by Amanda. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for letting me participate. <laughs> Okay, uh, that concludes general business. We have one item left on reports. So we have a community survey. Um, council recall that in a previous work session we had um, Peter Leatherman and Morris Leatherman come out and work with the council on the suite of questions for the community survey. The council provided direction on the basic set of questions. So uh, Peter had updated it based on that feedback and I provided that revised draft for your review. And then also the council had asked Peter to come up with some sample questions related to the topic of growth and development um, within the community. And he indicated he would come up with a suite for you to review, give feedback on, kind of all the card style. If you want to use it, if you want to use all of them, use some of them, want to tweak them um, for your review. And so those have been provided for the council as well. Uh, I think the intent uh, tonight is for the council to give final feedback, if possible, related to it, and then we would finalize the suite of questions. Peter would finalize the pricing based on that, and we'd have a contract on the consent agenda at the next meeting. And he can move forward with the survey in November. Okay. Anyone have any thoughts or comments on what was provided? I like the development ones. I mean, yeah. I have no objections to anything provided, proposed. I don't have any objections. Amanda, you've been so quiet. Do you have any big objections? Nope. All right. <laughs> so what I hear from the council is you'd like the full suite of development questions to be incorporated into the overall survey. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That I have direction, and we will get the survey finalized. Right on. On the discussion by council. Anyone Do we want to bring up the uh, legislative visits or questions? Oh, yes. Oh, if you want. Or to, yeah. So as I reported to the council previously, I did talk to both our state senator and our state representative, and they are scheduled to come to future council meetings. Uh, senator Drahan is scheduled to come to our October 28th meeting, so it will be our next meeting. And then um, Representative Farr is scheduled to come to the November 18th meeting. Um, given that they're coming out and to give us legislative updates, we usually have a discussion beforehand to discuss, you know, what are what are our expectations. So I can reasonably say, hey, here's the format. 
and touch on these items. Um, and the council will ahead of time also discuss what's important because it's a little time limited. You can't sit there for an hour and a half. What are the things we really want to touch on with that particular um, legislator? So I think it would be good for the council to maybe take time tonight to talk about it, uh, give me feedback so I can let the senator's um, staffer know what we, what our expectations are for that so uh, the senator can prepare where you'd like him to. So I, you know, the one thing I'll just say here is I, I keep getting heat from other mayors about wanting us to just pressure him on affordable housing, Senator Dreheim. And I'm not interested in turning this into a battlefield. You know, he's a, there's been letters back and forth from his office to a number of us mayors. And again, like I said, back and forth. I, you know, I think maybe touching on affordable housing is something that I plan to bring up and ask them about, but it's not going to be an hour-long session of trying to fire bullets at them. Um, what are they asking? Like, they want <clears throat> him to Have you read support? the Elkins bill okay. or proposal? Yeah. It's, that's basically what they're asking. But I, I don't want this to be an adversarial type meeting, you know, maybe touch on it, but I'm just ask him to clarify his positions a little bit, but I'm not really interested in trying to pin him down or get into a debate or anything like that with him. I think he's taken time out of his day to come talk to us and tell us about the legislative session and see what questions we have. So I just want to keep that piece somewhat low-key. Are there other issues or other topics that people are interested in? From a staff standpoint, I think maybe just requesting that the senator contact us proactively when he is working on legislation that directly affects cities. Sure. Um, he has warranted in the past that he would do it, but right. that hasn't been the practice. Um, I think that would be useful because then we can help give meaningful feedback well as, as he's shaping the legislation. It's much harder to do it after it's already introduced. Um, that might be something that would be helpful and productive. Yeah, that's fair. Anyone else have anything? No, we can always maybe fire ideas at you via email. Probably. When are you planning to communicate with the LA? Probably early. So we get you somebody, the, sometime if, next week. If we get you something by, I'm not going to say the end of this week, but maybe Monday or Tuesday of next week. By the middle of next okay. week, then I can roll to get something together that I can send off to Tom as his, his staffer. So. Okay. Anything else? And which superintendent? Uh, we will have legal superintendent. Um, I have already advised the superintendent that one of the key questions that our council will be interested in is future schools and facilities and what does that look like longer term um, given that there is an elementary school in Lakeville but we are continuing to grow over long term. Two, what, what does the future look for like us for future schools in or near Elkwood New Market or at least towards this end of the district? Um, and then with that, he'll just be talking about, I think, the current school year and other ge general issues affecting the district. So. I mean, if you want to give him a heads up, he's probably all over this. I mean, I'd be curious to hear about how their transportation stuff's going, knowing that New Prague now is asking us all to opt out of certain days, and they may be canceling bus routes and stuff due to shortage of drivers. So I'd be curious if Lakeville was experiencing the same thing. was doing that. Yeah. Any other discussion by council? Uh, motion to adjourn. It's a motion by Josh. Second. Second by Amanda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.